going to be quite the day because we'll tell you in a few minutes. Uh, but we have many things going on. Again, it's going to be a marvelous talk with some marvelous examples of some of the ships that were involved. Uh, and we also have some people who are present during that kind of period of time. But before then, I'd like to introduce our curator, Elizabeth Bodine, to say a few words. Thanks, Mike. Uh, if you came in through the front door, you probably noticed that there is some tents out there and people setting up. That is the city and county of Broomfield, some staff members, we uh, they formed a kind of Military Appreciation Coalition and got the city to declare the month of May uh, Military Appreciation Month. Uh, and so today they're having a recognition uh, luncheon with, uh, there'll be pizza, there'll be free pizza after this event. Uh, and there's a few resources that we'll set up in the tents to uh, feel free to chat with them. Uh, also coming up as part of this like month long list of activities, uh, is this coming Thursday is a luncheon, a special veterans luncheon at the Lakeshore uh, community room in the new community center. Uh, it's, I believe it's free for veterans, $5 for everyone else, and you just have to sign up through the online portal called BREX. It stands for Broomfield Recreation. Um, that's the only catch is you have to sign up through there. So uh, yeah, that is on Thursday at noon at the community center and then free pizza today after this event. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Elizabeth is marvelous. I mean, this museum would have a tough time ever being able to continue to function without her. And we're always looking for some more volunteers, and particularly who can help us with archiving. I mean, every week we get in more donations of artifacts and things and all of that has to be categorized it has to be logged in uh, our exhibits committee has to go through and decide if we can keep it uh, and we really can always use some additional help uh, similarly for our docents <coughs> we even have uh, some vacancies on our board uh, so uh, uh, if you have any interest at all you can talk to any of us in a red vest and we gladly will uh, tell you what we've thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, okay, I'd like to first uh, identify at least uh, some special guests we have today. Uh, we have, I believe, Admiral Nimitz right here, oh, yeah. Bill Ford. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Well, anyway, well, we've heard the name before, so there's got to be. But even more so, upstairs, you may have noticed we have a marvelous new exhibit called the Doolittle Raid. And again, a very significant part of our entry into World War II uh, in the Pacific. And we have a gentleman here who is involved with that. Glenn, could you please raise your, stand up? Glenn Crummel, who is part of that team. Uh, and, and so that's just marvelous. So please come visit with, with Glenn and everyone else here. Uh, I'd like to highlight certainly our speakers today. Today, uh, John Petacolis, who's also our commander for American Legion post here, um, and will be our primary speaker to talk about the battle. But then, two good friends also, Kent Scrapko, Strapko here, and Jerry Galvedon. <laughs> They're the marvelous modelers who built these models here. We'll talk about that some more uh, in the, f you know, later in the talk. Uh, one last thing before we get going is time to check your cell phone, put it on mute. We know what's gonna happen partway through our talk. Okay, well, without further ado, John. Okay, and I'm hooked up, right? You're hooked up. All right, whose phone is this? That's mine. Okay. <laughs> uh, there you go. I hope it's muted. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, John Petacolis. Uh, my nickname is Bud, and uh, my call sign when I was in the Navy was Budro. Don't. It's somehow connected. I'm not sure because I don't control what your call sign is. <laughs> anyway, uh, so. 
Um, I, if you can read, you'll read the uh, handouts here and look at my career. I'm not going to belabor it. We're going to talk today about the Battle of Midway. I'm going to emphasize mostly what happened on June 4th, the morning of June 4th. The battle actually took place for uh, you know, three or four days. Uh, so leading up to the battle, uh, six months prior, we all know December 7, 1941, and uh, we entered the war. Well, for the next six months, and you can read it up there, uh, Wake Island uh, Falls, Hong Kong Falls, all our allies in the Western Pacific. USS Saratoga is torpedoed and retired to the West Coast for repairs. Uh, Singapore fell, the fall of Bataan. The Doolittle Raid was the one bright spot in that six months, and that occurred about a month prior to the Battle of Midway. And uh, there was a great talk on the Doolittle Raid here a couple, months, a couple weeks ago, so I won't belabor that. Uh, finally, Corregidor Falls, and then the Battle of Coral Sea. Now, a lot of people in the United States uh, at the time considered the Battle of Coral Sea, and Australia considered the Battle of Coral Sea a, a, a victory. Yeah, it, it was a victory because strategically because we prevented the Japanese from uh, invading Port Moresby. But it was really kind of a draw. And uh, we lost a carrier, Lexington, and the Japanese lost uh, a carrier also. So after the Doolittle Raid and after Coral Sea, the Japanese naval strategy, Yamamoto, uh, was personally embarrassed and angered by the Doolittle Raid. Uh, the story goes that uh, Yamamoto had, uh, had informed or told the emperor that Japan would never be invaded or never be involved in actual combat. And of course, the Doolittle Raid uh, showed that that was not true. So uh, Yamamoto argued uh, with the Imperial Japanese Navy. Uh, they had to destroy the, US, the remains of the USS carrier fleet. He believed the Yorktown had been either sunk or destroyed, either sunk or damaged beyond repair. So he was looking at basically two carriers left. Uh, the USS, I'm sorry, the Midway operation was designed to draw out the remaining carriers from Honolulu and from Hawaii and bring them into the open water for a showdown because uh, Yamamoto knew that he uh, far outnumbered the, Jap or the U.S. fleet. And so that was the, uh, that was the point. Interestingly enough, he, the four carriers he used were, uh, there was actually six carriers that he could have used, but the Army was insisting on invading uh, the Aleutians Islands. Uh, they wanted to attack uh, Dutch Harbor. They did, in fact, invade uh, Attu and Kiska. And that was part of a feint uh, that Yamamoto used to throw the, throw the US off. Uh, but that was, that was primarily um, forced on Yamamoto by the army. And if that had not been, Yamamoto would have had two more carriers that they could have utilized during the Battle of Midway. So the naval plan for the Japanese. So the mobile strike force, otherwise known as the Kidu Butai, which means mobile strike force, <laughs> uh, under Vice Admiral Nagumo would be attacking from the northwest. The Midway invasion force, which was going to occupy Midway, was out to the was uh, out to the west, and they were going to uh, invade or occupy Midway after the Kidu, Kidu Butai had uh, basically leveled Midway. The main body, which with Admiral Yamamoto, was actually trailing the Kidu Butai. And then, uh, then the two light carrier attack force faint up to the Aleutian Islands, which I mentioned before, attacking Dutch Harbor, Kiska, and that two islands. So, the Japanese objective, destroy the USS carriers. Of course, these are our USS carriers at the time. Saratoga was on the west coast being repaired. Yorktown, the Japanese really thought, was uh, either damaged beyond repair or being worked on uh, or possibly sunk. And then, of course, Enterprise and Hornet. And they all thought they were, the Japanese thought they were in the Pacific fleet. So the Japanese attack forces. As I mentioned, we got, I got a 
So the mobile striking force, which was the Kido Butai with Nagumo, was right here. Yamamoto trailing in the main body. And this was the invasion force. The invasion force was due to come in after uh, Nagumo basically leveled uh, midway and, and uh, neutralized it. So the formation that uh, Nagumo was using, his flagship was the Akagi, and it was basically task force of first ta one task force, well, it wasn't a task force, it was the invasion force or the uh, attacking force, mobile force one and two. And uh, uh, those were the four carriers involved. Hiryu, Soryu, Kaga, Kaga, and Akagi. So fortunately, uh, you all know the story about breaking the code. So, oh, no, oh you don't know the story? Well, le okay, let me, know, let, me, let, me, let me emphasize. So uh, basically, uh, Lieutenant Commander Roquefort, who was in charge of code breaking in, in Honolulu, there was actually uh, two, one in Washington, D.C., and one in, uh, in Honolulu. And um, the uh, Roquefort was in charge of the code breaking, and he was convinced that having broken 50, 60 percent of the Japanese code, that there was going to be a major operation against Midway. But he couldn't really. Uh, convince Washington, D.C. at the time. D.C. thought that uh, the Navy coding breaking in D.C. thought there was probably going to be the Aleutians or something was happening, but they couldn't guarantee it was Midway. So Roquefort devised a, uh, a ploy uh, through a uh, undersea cable, sent a message to Midway to, uh, in to tell, have Midway broadcast in the, in the blind uh, that there are uh, that their uh, water evaporators were broken. <coughs> and about a day later, lo and behold, they get a coded message from the Japanese saying that the fresh water at Midway Island, or AF, is, that was their code, at AF is down. Or, or, so AF is Midway. And that was what convinced Nimitz that we had, he had to do something. So Nimitz uh, took the USS Enterprise under Rear Admiral Spruance, that was Task Force 16, and the USS Yorktown under Admiral Fletcher, uh, who was in overall command, Task Force 17. The Yorktown was in Honolulu being repaired. Two days, the basically Nimitz said, you've got two days. We need this ship. Uh, and so the uh, 24 hours, they, they worked on the ship. In fact, when the Yorktown finally sailed, they had crews still on the ship repairing it, all the way to Point Luck, which was the rendezvous point uh, for the Midway um, ambush. So they placed uh, Yorktown Enterprise in Hornet, northeast of Midway, and that was uh, considered, they called that Point Luck. The uh, Enterprise and the, uh, and the Hornet sailed first, Yorktown followed. So Nimitz thought that the, this, he thought he had, not necessarily, it was a gamble, there's no doubt about it. But he thought there was a parity to a certain degree because yes, we're outnumbered, yes, uh, they have more carriers, but we have the element of surprise because of the code breaking, and we have Midway Island. So with, when you look at the aircraft assets plus Midway Island, and you look at the five, four to five carriers the Japanese had, uh, actually, um, we had more aircraft. If you look at it, we had more aircraft than the Japanese. Unfortunately, a lot of those aircraft were on Midway. B-17s, B-26, high altitude bombers. Not really effective against a maneuvering ship, but I'll talk about that in a minute. If you look at the, uh, the difference, so the total strength in the Kido Butai was about 260 aircraft. They also had scout airplanes that were out. Fewer scout airplanes than we had, though. We had PBYs, uh, quite a few more of PBYs that were out searching for the Japanese fleet than the Japanese had of their scout planes, which came off of their cruisers and uh, uh, battleships. The, uh, 
So that gives you an idea. But if you look, total strength of 127 aircraft, Wildcats, Buffaloes, Avengers, these are all, a lot of them obsolete. B-17s, B-26s, high altitude bombers. And uh, the other big difference is the Kidu Butai was the one involved with the ships that were involved in the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th. And all of our, all of these airplanes, except for Yorktown and Enterprise, the air wings were, were not combat um, experienced, including, uh, the including Midway Island uh, aviators. They were all really green. Uh, ensigns, first lieutenants, second lieutenants who had never been in combat. So um, there was quite a difference in that respect. So this kind of gives you an overall picture of what was going on at the time. Uh, and if this is Point Luck, this is where the Midway, Yorktown, and Hornet uh, eventually rendezvoused. This is the uh, the Yamamoto's plan, and you can see the northern force coming up here, attaching, uh, attacking Dutch Harbor. They have an invasion force at Atu, Atu, and Kiska. Uh, here is uh, the Nagumo's Kido Batai, Yamamoto following up, and then this is the invasion force with the with the ground troops following in. It was a complicated plan. It, re it really required a lot of split-second like, split timing. Here's uh, Nimitz's force. Uh, you'll notice these are our submarines, which we had deployed. The USS Nautilus came into, into, uh, uh, the play, into play, I should say, during the December 4th, I'm sorry, June 4th um, attack. Interestingly, these are the submarines that Yamamoto uh, put around Oahu to basically watch for the carriers coming out of Honolulu. Unfortunately, yeah. they had sailed first. The submarines didn't arrive until after <laughs> the carriers were gone. Close the barn door, yeah. they exactly, <laughs> exactly. So now we get into the complicated part. Try, I tried to make this as uh, understandable as possible. There were so many things happened on June 4th uh, simultaneously. So June 3rd, first of all, the day before, the Japanese invasion force to the west was discovered by a PBY out of Midway Island. So they launched a uh, B-17s, B-26s to attack that, uh, that force. Only minor damage and basically didn't touch the Japanese invasion force. But that invasion force out to the west was under radio silence. They did not break radio silence and never informed Nagumo that a PBY had discovered them. It might have changed. Might have changed the whole way Nagumo prosecuted the battle. The following day, June 4th at 4.30 is when Nagumo launched his attack force toward Midway. He kept half his force on deck, and he kept that force uh, armed with anti-ship anti weapons, torpedoes and um, um, ship ordnance type stuff, so bombs that penetrated uh, into, uh, into ships uh, for, and for their bombers and their uh, torpedo planes. But the uh, other half of the force then went against uh, Midway. The uh, search aircraft were launched at the same time by Nagomo because he still thought eh, there's, there may be the, you know, a U.S. fleet or, uh, or force of some kind out there and they wanted to make sure that uh, they had not been discovered. The, uh, one of those aircraft was one hour or a half hour late, one of those search aircraft. And then the Midway Island uh, uh, aircraft in route, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the, the Midway aircraft uh, actually discovered an in, the inbound uh, Kudo Batai attack force by radar. So that was an advantage that we had also. We had radar. The Japanese had, did not have radar. 
So they actually discovered the attack force coming in. Of course, they knew it was going to happen anyway. They just didn't know exactly when. So the Midway launched aircraft to uh, go against the Kudu Batai. The uh, Japanese strike commander radioed in after his attack on Midway, saying that we need a reattack. And he was very surprised when he got to Midway that, in fact, Midway was alerted. They, they knew that he, he was coming. And uh, they, they put up a, a pretty good fight uh, from the surface, from Midway Island. And there were no aircraft there. And the, the, the uh, commander of the, of the attack force realized there's no airplanes here. That's why he radioed back to Nagumo and said, we need to reattack. At that point, Nagumo has his, his search airplanes out, but he has not heard back from them. So at 0715, Nagumo orders reserve aircraft rearmed with contact fuse general purpose bombs and torpedoes. So that now is happening at 0715. So at 07534, which I talked about, Midway uh, radar picked up the in incoming fighters and attack airplanes. Between 6.30 and 8.20, that is uh, those basic two hours, was when the B-26s, the B-17s, there was Marine SBDs, there was uh, uh, Marine fighter squadrons, which were flying uh, Wildcat and Brewster Buffaloes. Brewster Buffaloes were far outclassed by the Japanese Zero. Every one of them was shot down. Uh, anyway, they, they started attacking the, uh, the Kudo Butai, Kido Butai, uncoordinated. They weren't talking to, you know, B-17s weren't talking to the B-26s. They weren't talking to the Marines. They were just going to go out there and attack. And that's what they did. Unfortunately, the high altitude bombers, they drop their bombs. The ships just maneuver around it. They look and see the bombs falling and turn starboard or port to avoid the bombs. And the same with B-26s. There was talk of a B-26 that actually supposedly flew down the length of uh, one of the carriers, uh, Japanese carriers. I don't know too much about that. I'll have to, I'm, have to research that. There was also a, um, uh, a I think it was a B-26 that uh, uh, was damaged and actually aimed at one of the ships, Akagi, I believe, and almost hit it, uh, but uh, didn't, uh, didn't make it. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Midway uh, movie, they have the admiral saying, or one of the subordinates to the admiral said, was he actually you know, trying to suicide dive on us? And the admiral said, no, the, brave, the Americans are not that brave. So supposedly that is a, a true, uh, true uh, statement that, that that did happen, or words to that effect. Uh, about that same time, 0750, is when the dive bombers, torpedo planes, and fighters were launched from the USS Enterprise and the Hornet. Um, immediately, the coordination falls apart. Uh, the, Lord, the Yorktown launched about an hour later because uh, Fletcher wanted to keep the Yorktown uh, planes in reserve just in case uh, they needed them for additional uh, attacking forces. Uh, the Enterprise and Hornet, the Enterprise, is, they're basically Combat ready. They, they've, they've been in combat. So that air wing. Hornet, completely green. The Hornet was a new carrier, a new air wing. None of the pilots or their uh, air group commander had any experience in combat. And, uh, but they were raring to go. Unfortunately, their uh, coordination fell apart. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So uh, the Japanese scout plane, which was late, finally spots the U.S. fleet, and, con and then after a few minutes confirms that it's at least one carrier out there. So Nagumo, what's he going to do when he gets the word at 0800? And this is an interesting thing, too, because it really impacts. So around 0745 is when the scout plane radioed uh, contact. Around 0800 is when Nagumo ordered weapons change. So it was 15 minutes because uh, the, ra the way radio worked, you, you, s you send a message, it goes to the destroyer 
or, or not destroyer, but the battleship or cruiser that launched that airplane. And then it's relayed to Nagumo in the flagship. So there was a delay there. But around 0800, Nagumo orders weapons change to anti-ship torpedoes. Now he's really worried that there's another carrier out there. And, um, uh, and he's got he's to basically take care of that. That's what their purpose was, to destroy the US carriers. All this was going on while the Midway bombers were high altitude bombers and uh, other aircraft were attacking the Kido, Kido Butai. So the Midway's attacks on the Kido Butai, if you look, we had B-26s, Dauntless attack bombers, B-17s, and Vindicator attack bombers. Um, they basically did not even touch the uh, Japanese carriers. Japanese lost three airplanes, and out of 52 American aircraft, at least 17 losses. So, Nagumo's dilemma at this point. Remember, he had an attack force out there attacking Midway. It's on its way back. They're running out of gas. They've got to be refueled. They've got to be rearmed. And he's now worried about a carrier, a U.S. carrier, out there somewhere, uh, he, he has a pretty good idea where it is, but he's got to do something. So his dilemma is launch only a limited attack force that he's already loaded up with anti-ship anti uh, weapons or recover the Midway Island attack force, fighter cap, uh, that's combat air patrol, uh, rearm and refuel them, and then launch a coordinated attack on the sighted U.S. carrier. This was the, the Japanese doctrine. Their doctrine was you don't launch piecemeal, which is what the US did. You launch a coordinated strike, and that's what they were experts at. So his decision was recover the Midway attack force, refuel, rearm them, and then launch them against the US carrier. Although I mentioned that the Midway bombers had not, or the uh, the Japanese carriers had taken no hits from the Midway bombers. So that was another reason why he chose to recover the uh, uh, attacking force and rearm. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, at 750, the Hornet and the Enterprise launched. Uh, here's a little story that is uh, not, uh, not well known. Um, when the, when the when the battle was reported in the press after, uh, after it happened and during the, during the war, uh, it was the Enterprise Yorktown and, and uh, Hornet had attacked and destroyed the Japanese carriers. But in fact, the Hornet never even sighted the Japanese carriers. The Hornet took off the, with their air wings and they proceeded on this heading almost due, almost due west. And this is where the coordination falls, falls apart. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Ring was the aircraft, it was the uh, CAG, the uh, carrier air group commander. And so he was leading the strike and for some reason, still not really well known why, his, that was his direction, that way he wanted to go. Uh, almost due west. Even though Nimitz, not Nimitz, I'm sorry, uh, Fletcher had published in the briefings that the Japanese carriers had been sighted down here and that a, they should have taken a course here about 239 degrees. For some reason, Ring took the uh, airplanes west. Waldron, now everybody knows who Waldron is? Lieutenant Commander Waldron, he was a commanding officer of Torpedo 8. And he argued, actually, Later on, 50 years later, people talked, there were still participants who reported that there was radio traffic between Waldron and Ring. Waldron saying, you're going the wrong way. And Ring said, shut up, join up, and follow me. Waldron got exasperated, and I guess there was a little animosity between the two anyway, uh, got exasperated and actually split off and followed his own course to where he thought the Japanese fleet was. 
and he was correct. Meanwhile, and I'll talk about that in a minute, meanwhile, the rest of the air group continues on out here, they don't find anything. So some of, this is where it all breaks apart. Waldron leaves, that started the, that started the break apart. Then you had some of the uh, SBDs that came down here to the south. Some of the F fighters who were running low on gas are coming back here. So eventually the fighters ditched at sea. The SBDs running out of gas went to Midway to refuel. And these SBDs here tried to get back to the carrier, including Ring, and he made it. Landed with his bomb still attached. <laughs> Okay. Not, not good. I understand it, they, they said that Spruance did want to see him. <laughs> <laughs> However, VT-8, um, Torpedo Squadron 8, did encounter the enemy and attacked. They had no fighter cover. They had um, slow airplanes. Devastators were 100, maybe 100 miles per hour, 100 knots. And they were just sitting ducks for the Japanese Zeros. And as we know, they were completely destroyed. And VT-6, which was off the, uh, excuse me, off the Enterprise, didn't have much, uh, uh, much luck either. They actually attacked after VT-8. Out of the 14 devastators from VT-6, uh, only four returned. Out of VT-8, none returned. They were all shut down. The only survivor was Ensign Gay, which you've probably heard about. He went into the water, pancaked into the water. He's treading water. He put a uh, sheet, seat cushion over his head because he was afraid that the Japanese, if they found him in the water, they would machine gun him. And because that's, was, that's, what Japan, that's what the Japanese did. So he actually put the seat cover over his head and watched everything that happened for the next half hour. There's Torpedo 8 pilots, 1942. I think Ensign Gay is right here. So what was the lack of coordination? And actually, the lack of coordination and the piecemeal attacks worked to our advantage. Uh, it resulted in piecemeal attacks. It delayed the Japanese counterstrike. Let me go back to here. So if you look here, they were, landing to, they were landing aircraft to rearm, refuel, so they could launch. That was when VT-8 and VC-6 launched, or rather attacked. It canceled that launch. They could not. They were maneuvering. They couldn't launch their aircraft against the Enterprise. And, the, and so that delayed it by that hour. And just after VT-8, VT-6 attack, lucky break. While they're rearming, while the cap, the fighter cap, is pulled down to attack VT-6 and VT-8, uh, Waldron, I'm sorry, not Waldron, uh, McCluskey and uh, Leslie arrive with their Dauntless dive bombers. Oops, sorry. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Leslie, Lieutenant Commander Waldron. The reason why Waldron was able to uh, find the carrier because he had also gone in the wrong direction but finally uh, came back up after seeing a destroyer which had been dispatched to search and destroy the USS Nautilus which had been sighted by the Kidu Batai uh, and then asked to rejoin the fleet. They're doing a lickety split straight line to the fleet and that's when McCluskey looks down and sees the destroyer and he goes follow that guy. He was out of gas by this time. A lot of the pilots were signaling him, hey, we're low on gas. He was saying, no, no, we're going to head up. And they did, and they found, they found the carriers. So this is what the condition of the car Japanese carriers were when they attacked. All their decks were littered with bombs, torpedoes. They hadn't had time to put them down in the magazines because of the switch back and forth, arm with land weapons, arm with anti-ship methods, weapons. And so the, the crews were trying to fast, as fast as they could do it. They just left the torpedoes on the hangar deck, the bombs on the hangar deck. So here's the attack. I just want to talk real quick about this, not long. The uh, attack doctrine, which the attack airplane, SBDs, 
used was that when two squadrons are approaching, the lead squadron takes the farthest, in this case McCluskey, takes the farthest carrier, and then the second squadron, Lieutenant Best, who, takes the, uh, who is the second squadron leader, takes the nearest carrier. That is what attack doctrine is. But McCluskey is a fighter pilot. And McCluskey, although he had time in SBDs, he, was, he, he was, had a lot of time in SBDs, but he didn't have the tactical um, experience uh, of an of a SBD pilot or attack pilot. He was a fighter pilot. He had just been recently promoted to the uh, carrier group commander. So here's how McCluskey attacked. He brought all, whoops, sorry, all 30 plus airplanes against one carrier. Overkill. Not a good thing. Best, who at this point is going, what the hell is going on? By the way, McCluskey's uh, wingman even questioned him. What's going on? But they're going to follow the leader. So, but what's going on? Why is he putting everybody on one carrier? Uh, Best, following up, realized after he's watching McCluskey's uh, VBS, uh, VB and VS-6 actually going through his altitude attacking uh, the Kaga, he realizes this is, this is not good, so Best takes three airplanes, that's all he could, vent. I guess that's his wingman basically, and breaks off the attack on the uh, Kaga and proceeds up to the Akagi. Best was probably one of their better pilots, was one of the best pilots. Um, and he, he, scored the, he scored the bomb hits, which destroyed the Akagi. McCluskey, uh, his group also, destroyed the uh, Kaga. So these two ships here, there we are, the Akagi and the Kaga are now dead in the water. The Hiru, which was further away, was spared, and the Soryu is where the um, Yorktown carrier group attacked. And if you remember, they were right up here. So after the battle, there was arguments. Who was the first to attack? McCluskey said he was. And uh, Leslie said, no, 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 no. We were the first ones on. It was basically simultaneous. As McCluskey pulled off target, he looked over and he could see that the Soryu was, uh, was on fire. And as Leslie pulled off, he looked over to the south and he saw that the Kaga and the Akagi were on fire. So it was basically simultaneous. There's the Kaga, completely destroyed. So I'm running out of time. So I knew I was going to reach this point. <laughs> so the rest of the uh, afternoon, I, uh, I have summarized. Uh, so after the Akagi and Ka after the Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu were destroyed, Nagumo transferred his flag because remember Nagumo was on the Akagi. He transferred his flag to the destroyer Nawaki and then uh, moved it over to the uh, light cruiser Nagara. The last surviving carrier, which was the Hiryu, launched a counterstrike get directed at Yorktown because by this time they knew where the, they knew it was not just the Yorktown they just knew where a carrier was and it happened to be Yorktown that they hit. Uh, the second wave from here, so they returned, and then there was a second wave from here. You because the first wave, remember their their aircraft have been a lot of them have been disseminated, so or had been uh, destroyed, and and they 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 don't have a lot of airplanes. The first wave were the t were their bom dive bombers. The second wave that they sent were the torpedo planes. So the second wave goes out, and it's briefed by the first wave saying. Hey, we, we, we found a carrier, Yorktown. Well, they didn't know the Yorktown, but they found a carrier and they bombed it and it's on fire. But there's another carrier out there. So the second wave is now looking for the, second, the other carriers, right? But the damage control, and I have a lot of sailors in here, so you all know what damage control is, was so good 
that on the Yorktown, they put out the fires, they um, got underway again, they were dead in the water for a short time, they got their boilers relit, they, they were underway. So by the time the second wave looks and they sees a carrier down there, it's not smoking, it's not on fire, and it's underway. That must be the other carriers. So they bombed the Yorktown again. And that was the one that put the Yorktown under. Um, after that, the, uh, the Horn and Enterprise launched uh, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Another strike. They found and bombed the Hiryu, and they destroyed the Hiryu. June 6th, which was a couple days later, uh, the Yorktown is listing heavily. Uh, and uh, it's been um, uh, evacuated. There's no, uh, no men on board. The USS Hammond has been pulled alongside the Yorktown to provide power. And they've actually got the Yorktown under tow to take it back to Honolulu when a Japanese sub comes across and torpedoes the Hammond and the Yorktown. Hammond is broken in half immediately, goes down in seconds. And uh, the Yorktown is, is finished. And then uh, on June 7th, remember I told you Hornet didn't even see the enemy? They didn't even see the carriers. Well, they finally <laughs> got some combat experience by, by sinking the uh, Makuma uh, when they discovered the Makuma. And I'll let uh, the others talk about Makuma and uh, the other Japanese ship that actually collided. So. Uh, you have a question? Yes. John, uh, on the statistics that were shown, it showed that the Japanese had some pi some planes that survived. Where the hell did they land? Yeah, uh, they didn't. They they well the ones that were survived. I mean, some of them were picked up. The airplanes didn't really survive. Uh, there were some scout airplanes that were picked up by the cruisers and stuff. But oh. as far as but as far as their attack force, but the they they lost two hundred and fifty plus airplanes. I mean, almost the entire thing. But there were several that survived. Those were the scout planes. Scout planes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the big thing too was that the uh, they had these were experienced combat veteran Japanese aviators, and many of them were killed. But that's not necessarily all of them, and there was they still had a lot of combat experience. The biggest thing was on those four Japanese carriers were all the mechanics, all the guys that took care of the ships. They all went they went down. They went down with the ships. And they lost all that expertise, which was very hard to recover. Here's the Yorktown being bombed, and it's at list. Is that, does anybody know who that ship is? is that's not the Gwyn, is it? The Hammond? No, could have been the Hammond. It, it might be the Hammond, yeah. And I assumed it was when I first did, but then I found out that your dad was coming back to uh, assist the Yorktown. And of course, this is the Yorktown being bombed. This is kind of an overview of all that happened. Uh, if you notice, if you notice all these zigzags and blah blah, you know, you have to realize that in order to launch and recover aircraft, carriers have to turn into the wind, and that's why you see all these zigzags on this on the side here. Plus, these guys are avoiding those high-level bombers. So they're maneuvering, and by that way, the Japanese uh, ship handling was really, really good. Uh, they, they avoided all those high altitude bombs, but that's why you see it so squirrely, uh, and this gives you an idea of, of all the things that happened during the, during the day. So U.S. Navy's success characterized in my order of importance. First of all, element of surprise uh, you know, by breaking the uh, internet, uh, the uh, uh, Imperial Japanese Navy code. The Japanese Navy mistakes, not knowing whereabouts of U.S. carriers. Um, squadron commanders and CAG initiative. The squadron commanders, Waldron, um, McCluskey, they were running out of gas. They took extreme measures, uh, extreme bravery. They went, when they launched, they didn't, they didn't really think they were going to come back. Um, this was a, they thought it was the end. And then, of course, pure luck, good and bad in the fog of war, Japanese lack of radar, U.S. Navy use of radar, and then, of course, individual pilot skill to drop those, get those bombs on target to uh, kill those airplanes. There are the losses. It's uh, pretty impressive. 
four carriers in the Makuma, 250 planes, 121 airmen, 3, 000, over 3,000 men, Yorktown, Hammond, and then 144 planes, 210 airmen, and 362 men total. So a clear-cut, decisive American victory. Yes? So the high-altitude bombers, mm -hmm. was the reason that they didn't come down and bomb lower because they were slow and the Japanese would have just <coughs> shot them to pieces? Yes. Well, yes. And it, it also is initiative on the part of the bombers. Bombers are going to, first of all, they're not going to put themselves in jeopardy when they can bomb, and plus inexperience. They just were not experienced at bombing a moving target. Um, but they're, they bomb from 20,000 feet. Seems like they would so, have down and laid right on. Yeah, so you know, drop those bombs and the Japanese are just looking up there and go, oh yeah, I'll just move out of the way here. <laughs> There's a great picture, uh, by the way, taken by one of the B-17s. And it shows the Japanese carrier maneuvering and all the bombs missing on each side. I was going to try to have that picture, but it's in a book. <laughs> I didn't able to get it. Uh, but it was a, a very impressive picture. Yes? Just kind of curious about, was there a difference in capability between a U.S. aircraft carrier versus a Japanese aircraft carrier in terms of Well, the Japanese carriers were uh, large. Um, and uh, as far as difference is concerned, I mean, they both had tor torpedo bombers, uh, uh, regular bombers, um, fighters. No, the, the air wings were, were pretty much the same. There were differences in numbers. The Japanese Zero was considered the top line fighter of the day. The Wildcat fighter of the uh, Americans was okay. The SBD was a good, good dive bomber, and it turns out when there's no bombs on it, it's a pretty good fighter, too. Yes? I, I'm an Army guy, so I, it looked like the, the Japanese carriers were like other ships with just a platform for well, actually, landings, were they? Two, I, be, I believe two of the carriers, and I and uh, Kent maybe knows this more than I do. Um, two of the carriers were built as carriers, and then two of those Japanese carriers were actually cruisers that were modified. But that was true of the United States too. We we did the same thing. Lexington, you know. Yes. Yeah, I just got done reading Ian Tolles first volume of his three-part series on this, uh -huh. and it ended with uh, Midway. But he said that one of the biggest differences between the carrier carriers was the, the American um, ability to put out fires. And Absolutely. And damage, damage control. And damage control their carriers versus the Japanese. That's true. More offensive minded. So the Japanese carriers probably in many cases were lost simply because they could not manage that, That's the true. There was, uh, you know, it compounded the fact that they had bombs and torpedoes hanging, you know, all over the hangar deck. Uh, that's what started the fires and the explosions. But, you're right, uh, their damage control was not adequate. Their, uh, their fire suppression, uh, their training uh, was not very good. And that, that lent to the loss of the ships, yes. I was just saying one other quick thing is, the book also said they upgraded the radars on the carriers before the Coral Sea battle, mm -hmm. so they actually could see further out and determine as the Japanese uh, they, carrier aircraft were raised, you know, their altitude. That's better. true, and they they could see them, they could see them coming, and that was an advantage that the American carriers had. They knew when the the Japanese were inbound. Uh, the Japanese did not know when we were uh, inbound. As same with Midway. They had uh, radar on Midway. When Waldron broke away, VTA? Yeah. Was there, when, when they got to the, f the fleet, did they radio in that they found them? Uh, well, that's a good question. They would have I, I don't know, because they, they actually had, a, the PBY had actually discovered the Kido Batai. So they, at least two of the carriers, they found two of the carriers, and that's what they were going after. And that was at that initial, heading of 239 degrees was uh, predicated on the sighting. For some reason, Ring took about 269, 270 degrees because he, uh, he knew better, I guess. Uh, nobody seems to know why he took that heading, but a lot of them, everybody, a lot of them question, why are you going this direction? 
The reason I bring it up is that that if there was communication, there was a lead radio guy that did that. Right. That kid was from Denver. Oh, yeah, there you go. It was Ronnie Fisher. Oh, cool. And I can tell you more about that. Yeah, that'll be interesting. That'll be in and so did he was part of what he was he was the radio man, lead radio man on in V T V T eight? Well, there was there was no that was, that was the, or, or there were no Swan survivors of VT8 so, except for Ensign Gay. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah, VT6 maybe. No, if he was he was um, he was on uh, Torpedo Squadron Eight, and and he was part of that first attack where they all got shot down. So he survived. He did not survive. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was I got I was under the impression that you were no. saying that someone else survived. I'm going. No, I don't was, think that's true. Was a, uh, an only child from. Uh, uh, interesting. Canada. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Then we're going to proceed to the next. Anybody step. like to ask? I've already asked a question. Anybody else like to ask a question? Oh, Bob here would like. To well, I read someplace that the B-26s were actually armed with torpedoes, and they tried to make them torpedo planes. Is that correct? I've heard that, too. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I didn't read. I consider everything that I read was bombers. But, but, but they, were, they were typically bombers. Yeah. That, to me, would have been a suicide mission. Well, hopefully their torpedoes were not Navy torpedoes, because yeah. the Navy torpedoes were just terrible. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK. OK. Well, thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, and we will push on to our next phase here. Uh, and I'd like to introduce a Kent, Kent Strapko. Uh, Kent's a Ar former Army officer and above all a combat engineer, just like me. So we have kind of a, a nice connection there. But he far outstrips any of us, both he and Jerry, in the quality of the modeling that they like to do. And these aren't from kits. This is from plans and fabricating all sorts of little things for it. And they're remote control, they float, go all around. Uh, it's just amazing what they are. So we didn't have a whole lot, but we thought we could show you some of the models that they've done, all connected with the Battle of Midway, uh, and uh, l tell you a little about their history and, and maybe a little bit of how you made them as well. So uh, uh, Kent, please go ahead. Your turn. There. We'll start out with the, uh, the cruiser Minneapolis. Um, after the Civil War, the, the United States Navy was primarily a um, blockading force to prevent the South from getting a lot of resources or cutting them off. And when the Civil War was over, the, uh, the country was kind of exhausted from the, from the events of that Civil War and was concentrating on uh, rebuilding the country. The Navy was a um, victim of that uh, period because there wasn't enough money to uh, maintain a Navy. Toward the end of um, the century, the 1800s, uh, the United States started expanding to an imperialistic type power in some areas like Hawaii and Philippines. Um, cruisers in the Navy, um, which this is, were used to patrol the, the seas and uh, show the flag around the world. That was their primary function at the time. Uh, the, the evolution of the cruisers uh, changed after the turn of the century and after World War I. We started to build the Navy. But there was a, a exhaustion also in Europe from World War I. So they agreed in the 1920s to uh, um, restrict the, un, or the unrestricted building of navies because Europe was basically bankrupt from the war and the United States had financed a good part of it. But getting 
to the actual Navy. We agreed to um, limit the size and the, of the fleet of the United States, and as did Britain, Japan. Um, Germany wasn't involved anymore. France, Italy, and a few other countries. Cruisers were then limited to two types there, light cruisers and heavy cruisers. Difference was heavy cruisers had 8-inch guns as a primary armament, uh, which are these in these three turrets. The uh, secondary batteries for uh, primarily for anti-aircraft or fire support or the shore batteries or whatever. Um, they also had a scouting role, which is why the aircraft are on here. Uh, I'll get into some of this a little later, but working on this ship from bow to stern is, uh, these were the main batteries. This was the uh, command and control center of the ship for any aircraft uh, fire direction and main battery and a secondary backup. It had searchlights for night, night fighting and these secondary batteries, the catapults for the aircraft would be turned and they would launch these generally in this direction into the wind. Uh, the ship's boats were there if the ship anchored and they had to lower these boats into the water by using the cranes or the davits down here. And this was a secondary control in case there was any malfunction or damage up here. It has the same um, functions as this one. Um, the USS Minneapolis was the last of the treaty cruisers that we agreed to. They had to be under 10,000 tons. Um, and carry the, well, the eight inch guns on them. The Japanese uh, also were under the same restrictions of the treaties uh, to one of this, relating to one of their ships. However, their compliance with the treaty was uh, questionable. They had a 10,000 ton limit and they would claim 10,000 tons on their ship that were actually 12,000 tons or more. Um, now, with a Minneapolis, this ship was built in the mid-30s, and it uh, did a, a cruise into the Atlantic just for shakedown. Then it was assigned to the Pacific Fleet. Uh, Cruiser Division uh, 6, um, this was the flagship of Cruiser Division 6. There were four more of the ships, three or four more ships, just like this in that division. Um, Minneapolis, when the war started, was 20 miles south of Pearl Harbor. It was conducting training, gunnery training, and various things. And luckily enough, the Japanese um, were ordered to attack specific targets in Pearl Harbor, not look for ships running around out in the ocean. That's, that was a submarine's job. So this ship was not damaged in Pearl Harbor. It went in, it joined a, a task force that went out looking for the Japanese carrier, carriers, and luckily enough, they didn't find them or, or they would have been attacked without air cover. Uh, the next mission of this ship was in the Coral Sea. Uh, the Navy sent, had, the only offensive force we had were the aircraft carriers after the battleships at Pearl Harbor were hit. Uh, this one uh, attended to the, uh, or escorted the uh, Lexington when it went down in the uh, South Pacific looking for uh, targets of opportunity and also the uh, <laughs> and shut off the it's green. 
um, and, uh, and attack some of the islands with the uh, new occupying forces on them before they got settled in. They then uh, returned to Pearl Harbor and went back out again into the Coral Sea because the Japanese were threatening um, the Solomon Island chains and New Guinea, uh, Port Moresby. Uh, the Australians were <coughs> in a position to give the, those, those up. But the General MacArthur said, no, we're gonna stand and fight. So the Battle of the Coral Sea erupted. The Japanese had two aircraft carriers, three actually, two fleet carriers and a small one. Uh, the Lexington was uh, torpedoed by Japanese planes and it was damaged and the Yorktown took a little bit, uh, little damage as well from bombing. However, the Lexington then had a catastrophic explosion of the fuel that it carried for the aircraft, had to be uh, abandoned and sunk. Uh, Minneapolis stood by that and took a lot of the survivors from that uh, on board as well as some other ships. When they returned to uh, Pearl Harbor from the Coral Sea, that's when the mid Midway uh, was forming up and they were getting intelligence that the Japanese were then going to attack uh, Midway. The benefit of the Coral Sea was that the, the Japanese carrier Shokaku lost or was hit by two or three bombs from Yorktown and Lexington and it was out of action. The Zuikaku was the other fleet carrier of the Japanese that lost almost all of its aircraft flying night missions and uh, being destroyed in the attack. So they weren't available to the Japanese for uh, the attack on Midway. So that cut their force by one third going up there. Otherwise we would have had uh, three carriers facing six Japanese carriers, fleet carriers. So that was the main benefit of Coral Sea is whittling down that Japanese fleet. Um, Minneapolis was not damaged in the Coral Sea, so it was part of the uh, escort for, I believe it was a carrier Enterprise. Um, as soon as they got back from the, from the uh, Coral Sea, they were prepping up to head out for Midway, so almost no rest in between. So that was her next assignment. Uh, of course, we just heard what happened at Midway, so they went back to Pearl Harbor again uh, to refit and do what they had to do. That's when the Japanese decided they were going to um, reinstate their invasion fleet in the Solomon Islands to, to cut off the uh, supply lines to Australia. So the Minneapolis was part of the uh, escort for the Saratoga. Uh, in the first part of that campaign, um, when the Sor Saratoga was torpedoed, it got hit by one torpedo, uh, the Minneapolis towed it out of the battle area <clears throat> until they got it uh, functioning again and returned to Pearl Harbor for repairs. The Minneapolis then joined the uh, um, uh, task force that was uh, going to fight in uh, the area around the Solomon Islands. Uh, three of these cruisers, just like this, one Australian, one or two Australian, and another, uh, the Chicago American cruiser, were the force that was guarding the beach uh, landing areas in Guadalcanal. The Japanese came in at night and they sunk the Vincennes, the Quincy, and the Astoria, ships just like this. Torpedoed the uh, Chicago, uh, which put it out of action, and then sank uh, the Australian cruiser Canberra. So it was a disaster for 
that was Iron Bottom South. Yeah, it was uh, Savile Island was Savile the battle. Island. So they took a good licking there. The Japanese were superbly trained for fighting at night. They had an inferior fleet in numbers, so they were going to rely on <coughs> uh, fighting at night, and they practiced that continuously until they were experts at it. So when they attacked at night, this was uh, the outcome. Uh, these battles continued for about three or four months in the same area where the Japanese fleet would come down at night, bombard uh, Guadalcanal <coughs> and the, uh, the airfield that was established there, and then head out and try to get far enough north back to their base in Rabaul before the aircraft from Guadalcanal could counterattack. So all the battles around that area were occurring at night. The Americans had the advantage of radar, but it was new and they weren't real experienced with using it properly. They had to learn that. The next fight that this ship was in was uh, Tassafaranga. They caught a Japanese um, landing fleet, or destroyers were landing troops because it wasn't safe for troop ships uh, to go down anymore with the air uh, opposition from Guadalcanal. So the destroyers were loaded with troops and supplies and they'd offload them and take them or ferry them into the island of Guadalcanal. This ship was leading a task force with a new admiral that just was assigned there and they had uh, five cruisers to face six dis Japanese destroyers. And the Japanese destroyers opened up again with their torpedoes when the U.S. O cruisers opened fire. The, f the first one hit was this one. <laughs> it took a torpedo here on the other side that blew the bow off all the way to back to here. It took another torpedo here in the rear engine room. So it cut its power to almost nothing, like two knots or three miles an hour. It, had to be, it made it out of the battle on its own and went down to the little island of Tulagi where they had emergency repair facilities. So they put coconut logs on this to get it down to a New Maya where they could put a welded hull front on it right back to here. The ship behind it was the uh, New Orleans and it took a torpedo also back here and it blew the bow off all the way back to the second turret. But that was the only damage it took. <laughs> it curved, the ship steered out of the way of the bow of the Minneapolis because they thought it was sunk, it was sticking up in the water. So they turned into the path of the torpedoes to avoid hitting the, what they thought was a Minneapolis but was just the bow. And then another torpedo, two of them, hit the um, Portland, not the Portland, the uh, Northampton. Both the torpedoes hit a f just a few feet apart and destroyed. Sorry about that. <laughs> so this ship went back to Pearl Harbor and, and to the main, I did. So I don't turn it off anymore. <laughs> so, so this ship went back to the first Pearl Harbor, then to the United States, and it stayed there for a year, getting all that damage repaired. And they took the opportunity at that time to rebuild the ship to modernize it. And for the rest of the war, it basically was used for um, shore bombardment and operating with, with the fleet until the end of the war. So that's kind of the hist brief history of this ship. 
Uh, it was put in reserve fleet in right after World War II, and I believe it was scrapped in 1956, which was replaced by newer and better ships. Um, so that's its history. Going over just what's here is the main battery, the command and control, uh, secondary batteries, uh, and the aircraft, I should say a little about those. These things were launched off the catapult, and their job was to scout for any enemy ships and also act as um, uh, spotters for firing shot, uh, the shots from the main batteries. Uh, when they obviously didn't land on the ship. So they would land in the water and this ship would take a turn and create a, a, a still spot, slick in the water. They would land on the, the water and the crane would be pu pulled out. And they had a little sled down here. The plane would run up on that and a little hook would hold it. Then they would lower the crane. The guy would get out of the <laughs> canopy while it was in the water and hook up the crane and the crane would raise the plane up and bring it back on board. This went on until the aircraft carrier started taking on that duty because it was a lot easier to launch planes from a carrier than a cruiser. Okay, we better move on. Yep, done with, or done with that. What's your next? Hello, I'm Jerry. Give you your seat. Oh. Uh, Jerry Good morning. I'm Jerry Gavaldon. Um I never served in the military. I just love building model ships and planes. And so I'm going to talk very briefly on the next two ships. Uh, Atlanta is my very first model, radar control model I ever built. The model is 32 years old. So it, it's also served in World War II. It was a fleet of light crews. Hey, Mike, can I get rid of this now? Oh, yes. Okay. It's not coming in strong. All right, I'll just hold this up. Yeah, let's stick that there. Okay. And this time we're going to hook it somewhere. <laughs> Throw it by, I won't sit on it. Oh. Okay. Anyway, um, the significance of Atlanta is that they were light destroy light cruisers, and their significance is in the bat night battle of November 12th and 13th at Guadalcanal. And that's where she was torpedoed and, and, and hit by our own ships. San Francisco, during the night battle, was called the Barnyard Brawl, where they were just shooting at each other. San Francisco hit Atlanta. And her admiral was killed on board Atlanta. And Captain Jenkins um, of Atlanta the ship was hit and mainly destroyed up in the forward section of the ship. Ne next morning, the ship was down on the water and it w could not be salvaged, so it was scuttled and sunk. Her sister ship, as many of you know, is the Juno CL-52. She was sunk the next day by Japanese torpedoes. The Japanese had a real good torpedo called the Long, the Long Lance torpedoes, and they, can sh they were being fired outside the range of these ships to get into fight. So, but... These are what the light cruisers look like, and um, if you look at the difference between um, Minneapolis and Atlanta, Atlanta is a l rather large ship for its size. But they're long and narrow, they're top heavy, and they um, mainly did the fire support. And um, the model, like I said, is, 20, is 32 years old. It has, it's radio controlled, it has horns and has smoke generators and a smokestack similar to Ken's ship, so we'd like to have some realism. So I'm going to switch over to another, go ahead, sir. 
Uh, are these two ships up front, are they built to the same scale? Yeah. Correct. So this is, when you look at them, that's relative to how they would look to each other. That's correct. In fact, all four ships are in the same scale. Same scale. Okay, the next one I'm going to move over to, I don't want to move it. Um, I acquired this from a friend named Stan Halpler, who, who lived up in uh, Indianapolis area. And he built the ship. It's the uh, Japanese heavy cruiser Mogami. And Kent will chime in and help me on some of the detail on it. Uh, Mogami had um, six inch turrets, correct, Kent? Originally. Originally built with six inch triple turrets. Now, the significance of those turrets, when she was rebuilt with the heavy eight inch turrets, her six inch turrets were moved over to the Yamato Masashi, which are their turrets uh, to support their uh, 18 inch point one turrets. Um, Mogami was in the Battle of Midway with the heavy cruiser Makuma. They had collided when they just spotted a submarine. Was that the Nautilus? Yeah, not a, the Tambor submarine was hanging around the area, which did cause um, alarm on these two ships, and they tried to do their uh, evasion. Well, Mogami went in there and hit Makuma right in on the opposite side, dead center pulled out and Makuma was in trouble and the Americans uh, finished her off. Mogami was sent back to Japan for repairs because she had a damaged bow where she received her new turrets, they're the eight inch turrets, and the stern was converted to a seaplane configuration. And on the model, this is what Stan has done, he, and this is a semi-scratch these are semi-scratch models. You could buy components like the Lanta. You can buy the hull, and Makuma. You can, I mean, a Mogami by the hull. But most of the superstructure is hand-built, literally hand-built. These are uh, kit aircraft of component parts, and he had to remake them and mold them to make them right. He even serialized the airplanes. I don't even go that far to serialize the airplanes, <laughs> but he did. Uh, on Atlanta, same thing, you buy components, and most of the ship is us. So we have to do the interior, the com engineering for the power, and to make sure that they don't fall over and roll over and sink on us. <laughs> so, um, but these two ships are good examples of uh, the Japanese color, and each yard had their own shade of gray. And Yamato was built in Kure, Kure is it Kure? Kure. 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 Kure, and the color is Kure gray. For their colors, as you, and each yard was different. So when we do shipbuilding, we have to find the right colors and the shades. Otherwise, when we go to contest, we get judged on. So did you use the right colors? Uh, yeah, I did. So, but anyway, these are the models on it. I have a large collection of 55 ships. I have I have four carriers, seven battleships, uh, nine cruisers. 14 destroyers and eight submarines. Where do you keep all these ships? Well, some are here, some are at home, and some are on loan. And what does your wife do? What wife? What wife? My dining room now is uh, fitting out. It's my float. My dining room is my fitting out basin for the big ships because I can't take them to the basement anymore. Any questions? Yes. Uh, what is the primary scale? Initially, what is the primary uh, method of construction? Is it plastic or balsa wood or metal? And where do you obtain the plans for these? The plans you get from floating dry dock and books. So before a ship is built in my yard, I do a lot of research. Most of the time is spent on research and a type. Like Atlanta is built as she looked in 45, but she wasn't around because I don't do well on camouflage. So the land is more or less just the way she looked in peacetime. Um, Mogami is fitted for wartime. The materials, materials of the hull in Atlanta and Mogami is fiberglass. Um, there's some masonite in Atlanta for the framing of it to give it the strength, which makes it rather heavy compared to the other ships. Then you get styrene, and you do mold castings and stuff like that. Now, 3D printing's taken over. Yeah. So I'm huge on 3D printing, 
And so I'm getting more of my stuff in 3D on my later ships so I can build them quicker. So it really varies on the materials. And so we call these semi-scratch because you can buy components, but yet uh, a lot of it is yours, like the deck is all me. The superstructure is me because there's not any uh, materials out there or any components of the ship available. Okay, I'll go over here. All right, I'll go over here. But anyway, you use various materials to answer your question. And the research is books and drawings. I have drawings. And um, like the Admiral said, where's your wife? Well, I have a girlfriend or two, but I mean one girlfriend, and she kind of complaining about no room in the house to sit down and have dinner. So we sit on the couch because there's usually a part or a ship there or something being worked on. I do have airplanes here too. So uh, that's for my side. Any other questions? Do you have the, do you have either the Juno or the Sullivans? I have, no, I, no, I don't have the Juno. Yeah, the Juno was where the, the Sullivan brothers was killed. They, no, yeah, they were killed on it. Yeah. I have their destroyer Sullivans, 537. Sullivans? Yeah, I have the 537. Have you heard about the Sullivans lately? Yeah, yeah. called a hole in the hall and leaking and yeah, leaking. Partly sunk in Buffalo. Yes. And they've got it up now. Right. So they're doing uh, midi mitigation on the damage and below and mm -hmm. all the artifacts lost. No, the artifacts were safe. Oh, they were. They were all. They were all able to be taken out. Uh, the family's artifacts were moved to uh, on shore. Oh, that's good they news. Were all safe. Yeah. Yes. Kind of embarrassing there because uh, they're expensive. Question back there, sir. Yeah. Are all of your ships World War Two? No, no, I'm eclectic. <laughs> I have World War II ships and pre-war, and I have uh, modern ships, like uh, they were doing your Burke display, and Mike asked me, Jerry, does anyone have a Burke-class destroyer? I happen to have one at home. So I brought Lawson over. Yours was the display Yeah, mine's the Lawson. Now I have York, I have Hornet, it's here, and I also have uh, Cass and Young in the uh, Pacific room. I'm about to finish the last destroyer. Okay, I'm going to finish the last one here. And so real quick, and Kent can chime in. By the way, Kent built uh, the Benham class destroyer minus Sterrett. Kent has uh, Benham under construction in the yard. But Sterrett served in the Atlantic side of the, uh, the war during World War II. And Sterrett uh, is a Benham class destroyer. And Benham was in, at, uh, on the Pacific. Ken, specifically, what river is Benham at? Benham. Was Benham uh, at uh, Midway? Yes. <coughs> yeah, Benham was at Midway. And these are the, Benson, the Benham class destroyers. And they also were at Gala Canal and various other naval battles. So this is just an example of some of the uh, destroyers that were available before the Fletchers and the Garings and the summer class destroyers came out in World War II. They took the brunt of the battle of the early part of World War II. So that pretty much concludes, like I said, they're all 96 scale. They take, uh, Atlanta took me a year and a half to build. I had Missouri just came off the line and that's my COVID battleship that took nine months. Had nothing to do. One good point to make. What? <laughs> So Benham was in the Battle of Guadalcanal also, and it was hit by a, a torpedo, and guess whose father scuttled the ship with a torpedo? <laughs> oh, Gwen? Oh, the Gwen scuttled Benham, okay. Well, <laughs> so, are there any questions about the ship for Ken and I to answer? We sure appreciate being here. Uh, Phil? The last battleship to battleship fight between the Washington, I think it was the Japanese uh, battleship Kara, and the gunnery was so good that they, the Washington hit that battleship below the waterline and they act with its shells and actually acted like torpedoes and sank it. Was that the EC or the Congo? That, that was this called the, the Kurishima. Yeah, but that was the called Kurishima. the battleship battle of 
the Guadalcanal, or the right. second naval battle of Guadalcanal. Right. They actually sank the ship using shells. They actually acted like torpedoes because they hit below the water line. The, the uh, radar they had by then and the training or the experience they had, they could pick up the shell splashes on radar <laughs> to adjust their gunfire so they didn't hit that hard. And Washington was not even damaged. No, but the South Dakota uh, totally uh, lost all electric power because some one of their chief engineers locked down uh, one of the master fuses on it because it tended to flip. So something happened which triggered it, lost total power, uh, it went totally blank. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? There was a question. Just yes, sir. I'm not familiar with the engines and those things. It's not about the battle, but they're called turbine engines. What kind of, are they like the turbines we have today, or are they a different kind of turbine, or? Were they Parson turbines? They used to have a piston, a triple expansion engines in ships like the Titanic and so forth. But the British developed a turbine where the steam went into a turbine spun the blades okay. and it went through a reduction gear to turn the propellers to get okay. the right speed. So it was like a power plant here. Okay. It was 600, 600 pounds of steam. That would take 600 pounds of steam. Were they Parson turbines? Because that's what they were British were using, invented by Parsons. Well, they were similar. Yes. the same. And the boilers were Babcock and Wilcox boilers. My uncle was on a destroyer and we're at an event. And he said, I was in the engine room. I said, he told me he was on the gearing class. I said, oh, were you working on the Babcock, Wilcox boilers? He didn't even know. He said, all I saw was these big monsters. I said, yeah, the Babcock, Wilcox were on the boilers, were the labels. Babcock and Wilcox also put the boiler in down at the Pueblo power plant. So they're still doing that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other well, questions? Just, to, f just to close out, this last slide here is kind of interesting to me personally. My father served in the Navy for close to 30 years, had served in the Pacific in command of a destroyer, the Gwynn, at some point. Uh, he had a marvelous wooden sea chest, which had been built for him by one of the ship's carpenters. And when he had died, I inherited all that. And he did talk a little bit about his service then. But going through it, I came across a series of some photos which were stamped all in the back, classified and stuff. Nothing written on them. Uh, and I kind of had a sensing this probably was the Yorktown. And it wasn't until many years later that I got hold of the actual history of the Gwyn and was kind of amazed at what it was involved in. At the beginning of the war, he was doing uh, patrols off of Iceland. Right after Pearl Harbor, uh, it was raced off to the Pacific, actually ended up San Francisco, became part of the Doolittle Raid. Came back from the Doolittle Raid, was peeled off to go to the Coral Sea uh, for that battle, but it was already over. And lo and behold, it came back in time to then escort a Marine contingent out to Midway, because we knew something was brewing. Came back from that, and immediately was sent back to Midway for the battle. Didn't arrive until later, but reading why I'm seeing this, it turns out that uh, it was sent out there and was at the Yorktown while it was trying to be recovered. They actually provided a salvage team to go to the Yorktown, and that's probably what this picture was taken from the Gwyn of a whale boat you know, heading over toward the Yorktown. And then they were there when the Hammond in New Yorktown was torpedoed. And then it ended up bringing, as it said, 102 survivors back to Pearl. And then from there, turned around and went out to the Solomons for that campaign, uh, where it was involved in several of the naval battles there and eventually was sunk in the Solomons. But anyway, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Please come around, look at this. The pizzas are probably upstairs and are probably cold by now, <laughs> but we can always heat them up in, the, in our uh, microwave. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you for presenting. <laughs>